So I'm sitting here with Scott Mayer, who um, is a real estate attorney with uh, Womble Bond in Dickinson. I just call him, uh, you know, WBD. Uh, you know, not WMD. It's not weapons of mass destruction, although some people might equate that with attorneys. I don't know. <laughs> So, um, but we were talking a little bit, and we we're talking about uh, the state bills uh, 326 and 721, which have to do with multifamily assets in California. And one of the things I mentioned was, you know, a lot of my clients, a lot of the investors I've spoken to aren't even aware of this bill and what it means to them and how, uh, what they have to do to be in compliance with it. So, and this affects every single multifamily or residential building that may have balconies or decks that are basically exposed. So I thought I'd bring in the legal expert here, kind of talk about that, when when it goes into effect, what dates you need to be aware of, when, and uh, what you need to be doing to prepare yourself for this. So Scott, what exactly is SB 326 and 721? So George, uh, like most laws, these were enacted to uh, handle uh, issues that came to light as a result of a accident that occurred in Berkeley, California mm -hmm. in 2015 when a deck collapsed as a result of dry rot. Unfortunately, five people were killed. Wow. Uh, and so the legislature took up uh, various measures to address the inspection of what they call EEEs, uh, ex exterior elevated elements, which, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, are include decks and walkways mm -hmm. um, and porches and balconies. Um, yeah. And s the state law 721 is geared toward uh, multifamily properties mm -hmm. of three units or more. Uh, measure th 326, 326 yeah. concerns condominium projects. Yes. There, there's no limit on the number of units. Mm -hmm. Now, both laws pertain to uh, wood-framed structures, not steel structures. That would make sense. Um, and th basically, they both require that professional inspections take place in those buildings that are subject to these two laws. Mm -hmm. uh, well, when you say professional inspections, now, you know, some would argue that I'm a real estate professional. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure if I'd make that argument, but some would argue that. As such, does am I qualified to inspect it? Or are we talking about someone who's actually a little bit more qualified, something like a structural engineer or general contractor? Would they accept a general contractor's? So make sure you check uh, which law applies to you because there are some nuances. Okay. But essentially, a contractor that has uh, a minimum of five years experience mm -hmm. Um, with certain licenses, okay. uh, an architect, an engineer, and even certified inspectors okay. can perform these inspections mm -hmm. and prepare the necessary report. Okay. You know, I, I've noticed a lot of the uh, earthquake retrofitting companies have really started to promote this and go out there as their inspectors, you know, because they're pretty much at the sunset of the earthquake retrofit for the steel moment frames when it comes to the soft stories um, that was required throughout Los Angeles County uh, for the last few years. And because of that, I think they're you know, looking for other avenues and we're starting to see that as well. So I, I can totally see that it can be contractors or other type of professionals as well as an engineer. So, but that's a cost. How often do they have to have it inspected? Because, you know, dry rot, if I remember correctly, when it comes to termites, um, you know, you can termite a property that does the very next day it can be reinfested. Yes. And dry rot, you can inspect it. It still may be rotting again in a year, six months, a year from now. It can really, and certain types of aggressive fungus can go through it in months. So how often does it need to be? So under both codes, uh, the initial inspections need to occur on or before January 1st, 2025. Mm -hmm. So coming up. So coming up, you have all of next year. That's a lot of inspections. That's a lot of a lot of buildings and a lot of inspections that's going to fall under. So for the, the multifamily properties of three units or more, mm -hmm. uh, a reinspection has to occur within six years. Okay. For condominium projects, the reinspection has to occur within nine years. Okay. 
Okay, and then, um, so they're going to inspect now. Do they have to do any kind of destructive testing? Because I know a lot of times decks, you know, it's hard to tell. And, you know, uh, and do they have to, if so, are they um, opening up all the decks and walkways, or is it just a percentage? So, uh, it's random under both statutes. Uh, one, uh, for multifamily units, it's uh, a 15% mm -hmm. threshold. Minimum. Yep. For condominiums, it's a 90% threshold. Oh, wow. And that's okay. determined by the inspector on a random basis. Okay. Yeah. Now, and, and the inspections can be visual. They can be uh, conducted by a camera. Mm -hmm. They can be conducted with infrared photography. They can be conducted with destructive testing. Okay. So it does open it up and then you want to... Uh, I mean, my advice would be to find the best person to be able to, you know, it, it, it's, there's a lot of new technology out there, but it's really difficult to tell something without opening it up and looking. So, you know, if you, I think if you really want to be sure and safe, you're probably going to hire somebody that's going to do the extra work and open it up and really look into it. Um, you know, the nice part is, like you said, if they can use cameras, it can be, it can be a relatively small hole that can go into the stucco yes. areas and uh, corners and just go in and see if the actual structural elements are set are okay. So that's the nice part. Um, now, is there any kind of uh, time frames? Like, it, let's say something, they did find something wrong. Uh, what's the time frame to correct that? So under both statutes, if there is an emergency situation, then they have to be corrected on an expedited basis. And the reports that are generated, and the reports will generally discuss the current condition, will discuss the useful life of the improvement, and will discuss recommendations on how to rectify any needed uh, repairs. Okay. But if it's an emergency situation, there is a, a shortened time period, both for the report and for the repairs to be conducted. Mm -hmm. And the reports are given to public agencies. Okay. And so they are now of public record. And the owner is required to keep the reports for two inspection cycles. And they're not only kept for further inspection purposes, but they're also kept for disclosure purposes. Mm -hmm. So when you're selling your property, you would have an obligation to disclose those yeah. historical reports as well. Okay. Um, now, if they're a public information, that would be common knowledge, uh, I would assume. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think you definitely have to disclose it, or especially if there are any issues that may have come up. Um, so. Uh, I think that's great because I think that also helps a lot of the buyers going into something where they're unsure of what's happening in, in, within the building. It's another added layer of protection for them. Now, what happens if we inspect the building and, you know what, I haven't had this property termited or tented and uh, in since it was built in the 20s <laughs> and there's all kinds of dry rot and termite damage and wood rot. Um, and it's going to cost me a lot of money. Now, are there any considerations for maximum out-of-pocket costs as far as, you know, like for instance, I understand that older buildings uh, under ADA compliance, if, if you can show that it's economically unfeasible to do so, then you don't have to comply uh, for the most part. Now, is there anything along those lines, like for the age of the building, for maximum out-of-pocket costs, if it was, you know, uh, if it was the value of the repairs were more than 25% of the building or something like that? Is there any kind of mechanism in there? Or is it just, you know what, if you find something, you got to fix it? Yeah, I'm not aware of any uh, mechanism that an owner can use not to do mm -hmm. the required repair at whatever the cost may be, which of course could be significant. Yeah, you know, I, I assume there weren't any maximum out of pocket costs because of everything that's kind of you know, one it's for the safety of the of the tenants and the building itself. But now, if that's the case, though, are there any is there any kind of government assistance programs where it might, um, you know, maybe low interest rate loans or something along those lines that can help a owner out because this could be a huge expense that's unexpected. George, I'm not aware of yeah. any. 
uh, government uh, assistance programs. Yeah. I'm not either. I, I thought I'd ask. Yeah. <laughs> but there are, in addition to these two statutes, there are also local regulations mm -hmm. that one must look at as well. So uh, San Francisco has a local regulation that also concerns these EEEs, okay. decks and balconies. So uh, an owner of either a multifamily property or um, a homeowners association, not only should they check these state statutes, but they should also check local regulation to make sure they're complying. Last question, and I think this is maybe a little too early to answer, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask it anyways. <laughs> Put you in the hot seat. Um, when it comes through, when it comes to rent control property specifically, since we are in Los Angeles, and also there's a statewide rent control overall, um, but we also have LA Housing Department that has their own citywide rent control. Culver we have other cities like Santa Monica and West Hollywood and Beverly Hills that have their own rent control as well. Um, if the property falls under the LA uh, under the city rent controls. Uh, can the costs be passed through to the tenants as far as the inspection and or repairs in a certain way, either from a increase in the rental rates, like if you're doing capital improvements on a property, I know that the LA Housing Authority allows you to do some of that into yes. increasing the rents. Yeah. Um, so it may be too early, but you know, do you know, have you heard of anything along those lines? Well, I would certainly check uh, the appropriate uh, rent control ordinance to yep. determine if that's true. I would talk to your local rent control board just to confirm, but I would uh, hazard to guess that this is a, a government requirement and as such there should be some form of ability of, of property owners or homeowners associations to pass these costs along to their owners or to renters. Okay. Great. But again, one should check. No, I, I, I think that uh, is the greatest advice uh, is check, of course, because, yes. you know, every municipality is going to have some different rules and regulations. Uh, some are a little stricter than others, and some, frankly, just don't care. <laughs> so, um, but what they do care about, since it is a statewide measure or laws, um, that remember you have until the end of next year, 2024, to have it inspected. Um, so you have to get those inspections done as soon as you can. You don't want to wait if you're an owner of one of these buildings that has these exterior elements. You don't want to wait to the last minute because I can guarantee from my experience, you know, those owners that waited for either the earthquake retrofit or prior to that, the asbestos changes or anything else, they got hit with really huge bills from the contractors because they realized it was at the end of the last minute. So get ahead of the curve. Jump in. If you haven't known about this yet, check with your local and municipal authorities to make sure you're in full compliance and hire the right people, and let's get this work done. Thank you. Thank you.